Cyrus, thank you so much for hanging out with us this afternoon. We deeply appreciate your time and was wondering if we could start in the broadest strokes, if you could introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your practice. Great, yeah, thank you so much for the chance to have this conversation. My name is Cyrus Marcus Ware. Uh, I'm an artist and an activist and a scholar and a, a parent and a twin and uh, somebody who likes to be sort of involved in a lot of different things at any given time. Uh, as an artist, I've been um, practicing for about 25 years and have been um, making work that is explicitly about uh, activism and about organizing and about different kinds of justice movements that I've been involved in um, uh, as a way of doing what Tony Cade Bambera encouraged us to do to make the revolution irresistible through our artistic practices. So um, I've been working in a lot of different mediums. I mean, I, I started uh, mostly working in painting uh, and then shifted into doing a lot of drawing practice. I've been making these very large scale portraits of activists that are, you know, 12 feet tall, 10 feet tall, that um, kind of celebrate their labor, their organizing, their love, uh, all of the things that they're involved in. Um, and then uh, have been working in performance art as well. And through performance art, uh, got involved in organizing in theater uh, and uh, have now uh, written several plays and uh, performed them. And, you know, it's been really exciting to get to work across different mediums. And then uh, as an activist and as a scholar, you know, I've been able to bring creative methods into those disciplines. And so I've been an activist for 25 years as well and have always used creative methods in my organizing. And so making banners and making textile art and you know, sewing the revolutionary messages that uh, need to lead uh, the march or need to be protection for the activists because we use our banners for a lot of reasons, including to protect ourselves. Um, you know, That's been part of my practice. And then as a scholar writing about activist aesthetics and really trying to think through what it means to bring art and activism together in beautiful ways in order to be catalytic and spark and inspire revolutionary change, uh, both in the individual and in a system. Um, so yeah, that's sort of what I've been, uh, what I've been up to and what I've been working on is just this big idea of trying to figure out ways of supporting movements that are already ongoing, that are trying to make the world a more just place and doing so using a variety of different methods and mediums that, that employ creativity and activism. Um, I hope that this doesn't take your introduction of yourself into a place that you don't want to, to go to, but you and I worked together for a very long time at the Art Gallery of Ontario, and you were an educator working specifically with, with youth. And I wonder if you can talk about um, that experience and how it intersects or not with um, the way you just described yourself as an artist and activist. Yes, I worked uh, working primarily with youth uh, for almost 15 years, you know, 14 years or so at the AGO, uh, running the youth program. And that grew out of my work, um, working in youth tales. So I was working as an activist, as an abolitionist, uh, working at places like PASAN, the Prisoners with HIV and AIDS Support Action Network, and also ACT, the AIDS Committee of Toronto, doing in-reach programming in jails and institutions. And I talked explicitly about that in my interview for my job at the AGO. And I, I think that they were like, okay, well, this person is definitely offering something different than everyone else we've heard from. Um, so anyways, I, I grew into uh, working with youth and the arts out of that initial work around abolition. And, you know, I was somebody who very, I very much at that time believed and still very much believe in dismantling the, uh, the system of age segregation that creates um, these sort of pockets of, uh, of, of communities that are, uh, that are uh, disconnected. And so I really wanted to question why we were so fixed on age as a category of um, sort of discernment in our society in ways that made it that 
youth were often discounted because they were generalized as one group and their ideas weren't seen as valid and they were seen as future visitors or future leaders or future something, not as full, whole, brilliant beings that are currently alive that have a lot to say. You know, and I can remember listening when I was an activist in the 90s, I can remember there was, okay, this is dating me, but there was this cassette tape that we got of this rally in New York. And um, it was around the war and around climate change and around uh, indigenous resurgence at, at that time. And um, the, the, the key speaker that had blown everybody away, which, which is why there was this cassette tape of her, of her speech was 13, you know? She was leading this, you know, massive, massive rally with thousands and thousands and thousands of people in New York. And she was 13 and she had so much to say. And I knew in that moment that we were doing a real disservice by creating these sort of fixed categories uh, of age that were relatively arbitrary and that were really rooted in capitalism and capitalist ideas of productivity and availability. And so all of this is to say, I came into youth work questioning why we were doing youth work as a thing that was somehow separate from other work. So I really tried to create the kind of youth program that gave a lot of autonomy and authority and power to the youth participants to be able to self-direct, to be able to be seen as colleagues, to be able to be seen as artists, to be able to be um, engaged with, with respect and with um, consideration and really fought for, um, for their work to be considered inherently valuable because it was, you know, and not to have it just discounted or uh, somehow dismissed because it was being made by somebody under the 18 to 35 capitalist productivity range, you know? Um, and similarly, you know, I was working with other colleagues and, and, and organizers at the AGO like Jillian McIntyre around some other things that were happening around older adults. So adults who were available in the day because they were retired were also being kind of grouped into one lump and talked about as one thing and not seen as individuals and also not seen as contributors because they were seen as after the period of productivity. And so really trying to dismantle these age categories while at the same time trying to create a really meaningful experience for these young people who had come and were excited about being in this youth program and were excited about engaging in art. So, you know, there was a little bit of uh, activism involved in that work. You know, I was bringing my art, my activism and my creative approach to activism into that work and was saying, you know, how do we create a semi-autonomous zone, you know, in this youth center where magical things can happen, where, where up is down and down is up, where the young people have are holding the reins, where they are the ones who get to decide their destiny and what, what it was that they were meant to do with us, you know? And I think that it was really exciting to be able to create those kind of conditions, even if they were temporary or they only were able to exist within a certain bubble, they existed and that was really magical. Oh, I love so many of the things that you're saying. And I have a number of different sort of sparks and trajectories that I want to go, but staying with you here in your response about thinking about the, you know, in some ways the arbitrary categories around mm, clusters like youth or seniors or the way in which institutions tend to pod people. Of course, academia and teaching and university is another space where this kind of work happens and where power and hierarchies are reinforced. And I wonder how you think about your role as a professor, artist, activist, uh, along similar lines or with similar themes. Absolutely. It's so interesting being, um, I'm so thankful to be working in an academic environment that is really supportive of these kind of questions, of questioning power, of questioning um, you know, questioning what we know to be true and questioning, you know, these kind of systems. Um, so I feel, I feel really supported in my institution to do this kind of exploration, but I've been similarly, you know, thinking about that idea that Chinyure Apara talks about, about creating these semi-autonomous zones in our classrooms as activist scholars. 
And I love that uh, if, oh, I, 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 can I say one more reading to read? <laughs> but yes. Mona Ozakare Ray and Chinaria Parra's uh, readings on activist scholarship is so incredible and I think has really guided a lot of my work. But this idea of creating a semi-autonomous zone in the classroom where there are different conditions than normally exist in the academic industrial complex. So I, you know, prior to the pandemic would have classrooms that had food. You know, I would have classrooms where we where we would collectively share uh, responsibility for bringing in uh, food to eat together, or we would do creative projects as alternatives to written format projects where we would even in a non art class, you know, where there were these different kinds of ways of engaging with each other that redistributed power uh, in a different way and also um, this idea of risk and responsibility, you know, and what uh, we were willing to do in the institution to push for the kinds of changes that needed to happen and how we could share that risk uh, from doing that work. Um, so I was really uh, very thankful for that. And then now in this virtual environment where we're trying to learn in these, you know, most unlikely of conditions, you know, I've really been, you know, trying to think about uh, how to engage with my students in a way that uh, allows them to be uh, fully embodied in this moment, you know, that allows them to uh, feel supported and engaged with um, uh, as a peer, you know, who is also going through a pandemic, who is also struggling with this reality, um, and uh, really trying to disrupt some of the pressures of the academic industrial complex and its you know, insistence on marking and grading and trying to think, you know, are there other ways that we can assess what is being learned, um, you know, in ways that are more generative, you know, for the actual students involved. So I think that there's always room for activism to sprinkle some activism into our institutions and activist scholarship is something that is very, uh, um, very I'm very passionate about it for sure. I'm wondering, um, you know, given how obvious it is that um, you question categories and you question our assumptions about um, the way everything is defined or understood, what did you think when you received the invitation to participate in something that we were calling um, a feminist art field school? Um, was that a, a, a moniker that made sense to you or? You had me at <laughs> well, all of the words, but you had me at field school. You, we, you had me at field school because one of the things that I have been able to do that I feel very fortunate to have been able to do is to spend the last you know, 18 to 20 years studying activist history. And I used to do a community radio show called Resistance on the Sound Dial, where I interviewed artists and activists. I did that show for 17 years and, you know, got to engage with so many incredible folks, like artists like Octavia Butler, activists like Georgina Beyer, and, you know, I, you know artists like Ursula Rucker, like just really engage with artists and activists who were doing this kind of radical work. And, um, you know, I just feel very thankful for the chance to have been able to sort of study and learn about activist history. I, there's this incredible poster series that comes out of Just These, which is a printmaking collaborative and cooperative that's uh, across Turtle Island. And they have um, a sort of an activist poster series. And I have several of the ones that they have about the different field schools that sprung up in you know, the 50s and the 60s and 70s as a way of uh, teaching uh, communities in particular ways, you know, in ways that they weren't learning in the traditional school system as a subversion. So the idea of a field school is very appealing to me as an activist because I've seen the revolutionary potential of what a field school can do. And then when you bring in the idea of in, in, you know, imbuing it with feminist uh, politic and um, an art, an art, right? An art and to be able to bring all of those things together feels very, uh, very revolutionary, you know? And I think that we're in a moment uh, when you asked me initially, 
we were in the beginning of uh, the uprisings. You know, the uprisings hadn't really begun yet of, of that summer that, that would fall a couple of months later. And very quickly, it became apparent that we were in a revolution, you know, because revolution is not a one-time event, but a process. And we are in the middle of a revolutionary moment. So um, now is a moment for those principles of each one teach one, which grows out of Black revolutionary thought. You know, now is the moment for field schools. Now is the moment for feminist research. Now is the moment to uh, dedicate ourselves to learning and knowledge together uh, because uh, literally everything is at stake in this moment because we are, you know, we are, we are in it now. We are, we are in this battle and uh, change is assured. And Asada Shakur reminds us that we are going to win this. So it's just a moment to really re re regather. So very excited about the potential of what a feminist field school could do that was rooted in a creative application. I wonder if you might think out loud with us about the role of space and place in your work. So I know that you work in public, in private, in galleries, on streets, on screens, in audio spaces. And I know it's a little bit of a chicken or an egg question. Does the project produce the space? Does the space produce the project? But can we talk about space and place as it relates to your activism and your art? Yeah, I'm very interested in this idea of public space. And I think about, I was just talking with a friend um, the other day about those Reclaim the Street marches that used to happen in the 90s where we would gather, uh, it was warm, so maybe it was June, I want to say it was June, someone can correct me, but we would gather and do a snake march through the streets to, you know, whose streets are streets, you know, that, the, that we were sort of reclaiming public space from the state, even again, even if it was just in the confines of the three hours of the march, you know, and the idea of public space being contested, the idea that we're living in a moment of incredible fights for Indigenous resurgence, where there are so many questions about uh, land and about space, uh, you know, where we're seeing uh, visibly seeing the presence of encampments in all of the parks, you know, all throughout the city that I'm in, in Takaranto, and, you know, the city not responding to the fact that there isn't space or that they're not creating space for people to be able to be housed and to be sort of cared for. Um, so all of this, you know, leads me to understand that space is contested, you know, and then like uh, this idea that space is the place, space is, you know, such a, an essential question. So I was able to work on a project. Um, I've done several projects in public space, but most recently did a project called Radical Love, which um, was a project that grew out of an activist uh, moment and became this sort of monument series that was exhibited at the Benway and commissioned as part of their safety in public space project. And I was you know, commissioned to do a work about uh, public safety. And, and I immediately thought of trans people and I immediately thought of uh, this idea of these monuments because of course it was coming right at the end of the summer of uprisings where we had seen arrests uh, because of paint splattered on statues, you know, uh, that these statues were given more care than the activists who spent a night in jail and, you know, who had um, experienced such violence at the hands of the state. So I was thinking about how the state was so intent on protecting these monuments to slavery and colonialism and how activists were so intent in taking them down. And I was watching all over North America, all over Turtle Island, you know, these monuments being pulled down and tossed in the river, you know, or institutions taking them down, like the AMNH in New York taking down the, uh, the Teddy Roosevelt uh, statue. So, you know, really interested to see Toronto's response of arrests and detainment, uh, rather than, you know, engaging in this question of what we, what should we do with these monuments. Um, so I was really thinking a lot about that. And I thought, well, what would happen if we did take these monuments down? And what would we want to have, if anything, in their, in their place, you know, and so in its place. And so I started thinking about 
who I would love to see celebrated and honored in public space. And of course, that would be some of the activists who have really been fighting on the front lines. And I think always of trans women of color. Um, and I think of what Sylvia Rivera, you know, talked about, about how trans people were often on the front lines because we had nothing left to lose. Um, and I thought about the incredible labor of Black trans women uh, in our movements and uh, the incredible uh, labor and organizing of Black uh, non-binary folks. And so I decided to create a series of monuments that were dedicated to Black trans women and Black non-binary folks um, and, and Black and an Afro-Indigenous Afro as well. And I did these uh, monuments that had portraits of Monica Forrester, who's a longtime sex worker activist and street out outreach worker, um, portraits of uh, a young uh, um, lawyer to be named Chris, who's been a long time activist with BLM and who is uh, now trying to uh, you know, get involved in uh, being able to advocate for people in their cases and portraits of Raven Wings, who again is a longtime organizer and activist and co-founder of Black Lives Matter Canada. And so I did these portraits that were designed to light up. They were like these shapes, geometric shapes that lit up at nighttime because I had done a bunch of research before working on the project and I had interviewed trans people about their experience in public space. And so many folks talked about not feeling safe in the daytime because there was more people more uh, chance of transphobic encounters so there were people who talked about walking at 2 a.m and saving their their journeys for really late at night because there was less people so i thought well what would it look like to come upon these things that were lit up just for you so that at 2 a.m there was a beacon of hope or light that you could sort of encounter uh, as you were walking through the streets so that's what they did but they also glowed in the day as well and um you know i've been really thinking about these kind of things, these interventions in public space, you know? Um, we also did a, um, a 7,500 square foot mural on College Street uh, in front of police headquarters that said, defund the police, you know, right at the beginning of the uprisings. And I designed the mural. Um, I had to measure it out in this particular way that was not very obvious because I was right in front of the police station and I was like, you, know, you couldn't just get a measuring tape and start measuring and to do it in this very surreptitious way, but measured it out and designed this mural and just hoped that my, you know, grade 12 math was, was right, you know, that I could sort of extrapolate the drawing to 7,500 square feet and, and, it, and it did in fact work. And we created this beautiful, very pink, very queer mural that took up public space again, you know, and in that particular location and said, you know, this is the message that the, the people are bringing. Uh, you know, it's time to get rid of these monuments to slavery and colonialism, in, and the largest one being the police and prison system. So, um, have really enjoyed working on these kinds of projects that make us think about public space in different ways that are uh, pleasures to come upon as activists and organizers in the city to come and see an image of another activist or another trans person or to see a message that is close to your heart uh, you know was an offering right so I've been really interested in that um, and I love the idea of bringing creative elements into the city and out of the gallery for a variety of reasons. I mean, the gallery space is essential and I know that there's a lot that needs to happen and I'm thankful always for the chance to show my work uh, in galleries and very thankful, but I really think about what Emory Douglas was doing as a revolutionary artist for the Black Panther Party where when he created his artworks that were largely reproduced in the Black Panther magazine, he would also do wheat pastes of them up in, uh, in neighborhoods where Black people lived. And he would uh, make sure that the work that he was creating was exhibited in the street as well as in these other mediums so that it was more accessible to people. And importantly, he would write at the bottom how he made it because he, what materials he used and how he made it because it was a school too. He wanted to make sure that other people would be able to seize the means of production to be able to make their own creations to be able to also put messages up on walls. And I think that, you know, that idea of the 
public space being a potentially catalytic space for change making. I really embrace that. So I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about the chance to work in public space. Thank you. I'm um, going to try and make a link between um, the public monument and the archive so we can talk a little bit about um, the text that you've shared with us, all power to all people. And, um, you know, thinking about the, um, the colonizers represented in those old style monuments, um, Sir John A. Macdonald and, and the like, um, an argument made about uh, leaving the, the monuments in place is that um, you know they are they are markers of a history, good and bad, and that that they should be there so that we can engage with that history. And of course, a bronze sculpture of a man doesn't tell the the complex story, um, and one would assume that you could go to the archive to get the full story um, that one, one might assume that archives are um, uh, objective and that all of the information is there. Um, but in your, your article, it becomes clear how um, archives are also um, failures of history telling as well. Can you talk a little bit about your experience working in archives and what, what brought you to write that article? Yes, absolutely. I was uh, very fortunate to get to work with Dr. Jen Harita Warren on the Project Marvelous Grounds, which was this sort of queer counter archiving project that looked at QG BIPOC's contributions and history in Takaranto. And through that project got to really engage with what I had known for years to be true, which was these huge gaps and holes in local archives of Black queer history. So I spoke at the first ever Queering Black History Month event, which happened in maybe 2006, um, you know, back at, at X University. And um, at that uh, event, there was this discussion about the need for a Black queer archive because there was so little trust in places like what was then named the Lesbian and Gay Archives. I mean, talk about an exclusive name. They've since renamed themselves as the Archives with a Q. But, you know, just that the, there was a lack of trust with uh, the ability for that archive to understand and interpret our material to be able to engage with the content, to know how to preserve and care for it, to understand uh, how to program it. Uh, like there was just such steeped white supremacy within that archive uh, that had, uh, and other things that had led to, to these issues of trust with the community, that there was a need for something different. And so, um, you know, I had been really engaged with this idea of trying to figure out why particular things were being collected and why other things were not. Because of course, archives are responsible in large ways for literally deciding who and what we consider to be inherently valuable and who we consider valuable enough to be remembered. <laughs> you know, and I, uh, I think about this story I heard of a trans woman um, artist who is well known, who has this incredible body of work who brought her work to the archives uh, to, to donate it to the collection. And then maybe a year and a half later, uh, you know, needed to borrow something back for an exhibition and went to the archives to find out if she could borrow it back and they hadn't even opened the box, you know? And there was just this lack of attentiveness and lack of engagement with anything other than white gay males history. Um, and that was because of who was working there. That was because of the, the conditions. And, you know, I was really concerned by that, but I had also had my own experiences being told that our memories were not the memories and our stories were not the stories that were going to be recorded 
uh, about queer history in Toronto. So I had had this engagement, which I talk about in the end of the article, with um, a self-proclaimed uh, sort of elder, community elder, who had been there at the bathhouse raids and had been there in the organizing in, in the days after and had played a pivotal role in organizing. And even though in the video that Nancy Nichols shot uh, that documents the bathhouse raids, you can see the video of Indigenous Two-Spirit activist Billy Morasti running up the stairs of the legislature and rattling the doors and being physically there so that that person is the person who had that image that everyone will remember even though we actually have it on video, this elder was like, you know, there were no trans people of color there. I know, I would have remembered. So it was like, it didn't matter that Monica Forrester exists. It didn't matter that she was doing all this incredible work in Takaranto at that time, that she's a real human being. This person didn't know, notice her or know her. So it, she didn't exist. Her, her contributions were erased. And I think that that largely was my experience within a lot of white queer organizing was that uh, the contributions and the stories of racialized people were being disregarded. And when we were working on Marvelous Crowns, we had uh, you know, this idea of doing this in a different way of counter archiving. And, um, you know, one of the ways that we did that was by collecting stories in an alternative format. So doing interviews and, you know, doing these and having people write narrative stories. And there was this uh, reviewer who reviewed our work before it went to publication and they questioned, again, it was a white queer um, an, an elder who questioned an article by a queer elder of color who talked about uh, her, her experience in this early queer group and how there was this, you know, there were, there were uh, women of color in the group and the elder was like, no, there weren't, I would remember. So you should take it out of the book. And, and just so dismissive, right? So just this way where the white memory becomes the memory and anything else is somehow erased from history. So um, to me, that's outrageous. You know, that's just absolutely outrageous. And so I've been very interested in the archive, the radical potential of counter archiving of the stories that we tell and retell when we're together on the corner of the ways that we, uh, you know, archive our community every time we gather for Blockorama of the ways that we tell our stories and, you know, these underground community radio shows and, and things like that, the ways that we sort of capture these things, because we know that if we just rely on these mainstream archives that are allegedly neutral, they are not going to do the job of capturing our stories. I had interviewed Monica Forrester about her uh, early organizing, and she said, and I talk about this in the article, she says, oh, I wish we had taken pictures, or I wish we had saved pictures, as if it was somehow her responsibility to collect and archive this movement when other people's stuff was being rapidly collected. Uh, so it actually wasn't on her, it was on whoever was in power at that time who was deciding who was inherently valuable. So anyways, here we go in this revolutionary moment where everything is up in the air, where the fires are burning, where change is coming. I'm really interested in how we capture this moment and how we remember who was involved in organizing in this moment, who was at the front lines and who was doing the underground or the background work and who was doing like, just how are we going to capture this moment and how are we going to record it so that you know people aren't being erased you know so that the contributions of all of these different communities aren't being erased from this magical time that we find ourselves in thank you you know thinking about capturing and recording and remembering i'm returning to um a sentence that you offered early in our conversation about things being beautiful in order to be catalytic and so i was wondering if you might reflect on the role of beauty in social movement building or the role of beauty in your art making. Yeah, I, I mean, one of the things I'll talk about is the activist portrait series that I've been drawing, you know, because it was just this opportunity for me to show this outpouring of love to these activists, right? Um, because I get to draw them at their 
absolute most beautiful best, you know, where they're in a moment, I, you know, I interview them and I ask them these questions and I take photographs and then draw from photographs. And so I capture them when they're, you know, in that moment of reverie where they're, you know, talking about love or they're talking about change and, uh, and I get to draw them, you know, as, in, as their beautiful whole selves, you know, and part of why I do that is because there was the, the reaction to using a super realist uh, approach and aesthetic and capturing someone in the middle of a movement or in the middle of speech and drawing it at that large scale is that it creates, I've, I've experienced, it creates a response in the viewer where they wanna get to know the person better, which is fundamentally, if that could be a good outcome of this project that is so, that would be such a wonderful outcome that we want to care about these activists more, that we wanna make sure that they survive, that we want to get to know them, we want to support them, that we want to engage with them. You know, So uh, using these drawings as a way of uh, ensuring a connectivity and a support uh, for these organizers seems uh, really essential. Um, and so doing it through beautiful drawings that kind of draw you in and you're like, oh, come look for the drawing and then stay for the activism and like learn about this person and find out more about them and want to know, um, you know, that's really a big thing. And I think that with, you know, our activist aesthetics, you know, the ways that, like I'm so in love with banners, you know, I'm just so in love with banners. I just think about them I, they're such an underestimated tool of the revolution because of course we use them to set the stage. We use them to block traffic. We use them to literally hide people when the police come and so that people can kind of duck behind them and get away. We use them in all of these beautiful ways. And it's that moment where the artist has finished making the banner they've dropped the banner off or they've you know, shown up in the morning with the banner and we're, we're setting up for the press conference or we're setting up for the rally and the banner gets unfurled and everybody is just like, oh, you know, because it's this beautiful thing that has this message that we're all about to, to get behind and quite literally get behind and march with. And I just think about that. There was this incredible banner that Jenna Reed made for this gathering that we did in Ottawa uh, uh, of Black uh, and Indigenous families who had been affected by police violence, who had lost loved ones because of police violence. And she had made this banner that said Black and Indigenous Families Matter. And it had these, in each of the letters, it had both um, sort of African print fabric, but also sort of Indigenous uh, um, 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 sort of symbols and messages that were significant. Like there was like a medicine, you know, there's these different things that sort of told this story, again, with bright neon red and color, gorgeous, just such a gorgeous. And when the family saw this, and not only saw that they were gonna to get to stand in front of it, but that someone had made this for them, you know, to support them, to support their families, to support this fight that they were in. It was so powerful. And then the, the power of that artistic moment just can't be underestimated. So, you know, a beautiful banner also goes quite a long way, you know, and it is literally used for everything. So I, I teach banner making workshops all the time. Uh, because I really think it's a skill that everyone should know because it's, I mean, they're really fun to make, but also they are so useful in the revolution. They are so useful in our organizing. You know, rat -a -tat -tat, you spread it out, put a table, press conference in the middle of an intersection, baby. You've got it, you know, you've blocked traffic, you've got a visual, you know, a really beautiful banner can do a lot. So I think a lot about um, how to you know, so much of what we do with the kind of BLM style organizing that we do, it's very much about how do you grab people's attention? How do you do something that is unexpected? How do you go bigger than you've ever imagined? How do you sort of surprise people along the way? So, you know, grabbing people through uh, an awe-inspiring show of beauty is a big part of what we do. Um, there's a reason why that mural was neon pink, you know, there's a reason why that mural was that scale, you know, it's, it's, it's absolutely to be seen from, from the sky, from space, this beautiful message. Um, so beauty is a big part of it, for sure. Um, 
now is the time in the conversation where we start to talk about um, institutions and what role institutions have in, in social justice and activism and ensuring better futures for us all. Um, from everything that you've said, this is clearly something that you think about a lot. Um, it's also clear that, um, you know, our, um, we were probably infusing that question with an understanding of the institution as the museum or um, academia because of, of uh, this partnership between you, Vic, and, and the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria. Um, but you think you are thinking about all different kinds of institutions. So I don't know if that, that question is too, too wide open um, in, that, in that form. Um, and I will ask another question, which is um, a more specific question. Just thinking about the way you described um, banners and uh, the kind of um, kind of what's the word I'm looking for? I was going to say aesthetic. That's not that's not quite what I what I mean. But the sort of um, visual and process driven things that you're thinking about when you're building a protest. Um, you talked about like going big, attention grabbing, beauty. Um, those all seem like things that would make a really good exhibition and really draw people in. So on a, on a more practical level, what does activism have to teach to museums and exhibition makers? I think the biggest thing that activism has to teach to museum and exhibition makers is that taking risks can be can have really incredible outcomes that it is okay to take a chance to try something bold um, you know that's that's one thing and the reason why big and bold works for us is because we put trust in community and we work with community to pull off anything that we do so we've never done anything on our own we've always done it with community by community for community, which is something that museum and institutions could learn. Don't be afraid of working with community, embrace working with community and bringing more community in to decision making and into, you know, and into, into these kinds of uh, roles. It really strengthens the work and it balances the out over many shoulders and it allows uh, more things to be possible. When we did that 7,500 square foot mural, we worked with 80 artists, 80 community members uh, coming together who had to be trusted with a plan, who had to be trusted with, you know, very, you know, it, trust. We had to trust our community. And we're, we were able to do huge risky things because we could trust in our community because we had built that trust. So that's another thing is, you know, really learning to lean into and learn and work with your community. Um, and building that as core to your work. Um, I think a lot of institutions think of community engagement as something that only ever exclusively lives in education, if at all. And I think that bringing community into all sorts of decision-making, um, like if there was community advisories around everything from the menu in the restaurant to who we pick for the next board member, you know, like, wouldn't that be so different? It would just, it, and, and the community would trust you so much more because they'd be invested. They'd be like, oh, I'm involved here. Like, this is my space too. So um, that feels kind of like something that we could kind of learn from activism. I think that there's, you know, this idea that it's okay and in fact beneficial to really take a strong stand on a particular issue rather than trying to um, just appeal to everyone, you know, like that it is okay and in fact beneficial to be bold and to talk about social issues that are happening in the world, to be part of change making, you know, that's something that, uh, you know, could definitely be learned. Um, and then I think that, you know, that there is just, uh responsiveness that activism brings where you know uh rapid response um a way of engaging with 
social things that are happening in the world quickly rather than having, say, being so married to a 12 month or a 36 month or a 48 month calendar that you can't respond to say a summer of uprisings that are coming. You can't be like, let's do a show about uprisings. Oh, we can't, we've booked it. We're booked until 2023. You know, like activism is very much about uh, rapid response and seizing the moment and using each moment to be able to talk about bigger and better things. Um, and I think that figuring out ways of being agile um, and being responsive um, would really behoove it. You know, it would really do well for institutions in terms of seeming more relevant and seeming more engaged and connected to social issues. And so, um, you know, we're not in a moment where politics and political art is going to go out of fashion or die down because we're in a revolution. And so it's, you know, the best indicator of future behavior is past behavior. And you can kind of study the way that, you know, art responds in moments of social unrest. And, you know, Susan Cahan's Mounting Frustrations really talks about that. And so we know that we're in this for a moment. So why not get involved in the, in the conversation? So in order to do that, you've got to take the risk. In order to do that, you have to have the trust of the community. And in order to do that, you have to actually be, you know, able to respond and wiggle your calendar in order to respond to things that are happening. Um, yeah, I really think that we could think about abolition in our institutions and the way that abolition offers us an opportunity to reimagine our community and say, what do we want this to look like and feel like in 20 years? You know, how do we want to be together? How do we want to relate to each other? How do we want to respond to conflict, crisis, and harm? How do we want to experience love? You know, abolition questions us, you know, they, they, they have us question all of these things when we start to talk about abolition. And if we brought that into an institutional format and said, well, what are the conditions here? How do we want it to feel? I mean, I worked in institutions for years and I know that they could feel better than they do. You know, it could feel better being in these environments where we're working together. We could feel more like a cohesive team than we do often. And I think that we have a lot to learn about this rebirthing, uh, regrowing, uh, this new society that abolitionists are dreaming into being that is rooted in collective care, that is rooted in this idea that we take care of each other, that is rooted in love, you know, we have a lot to learn from that. And imagine if our institutions started to transform in the same way that our social world is starting to transform, to reorient a little bit more towards taking care of each other, towards care as a principle, you know, maybe institutions wouldn't feel so institutional. <laughs> maybe they wouldn't feel so cold. Maybe they would feel more like a lifeblood. Maybe they would feel more like a community, like you would be joining a community when you started to work in an institution. Because, you know, imagine you're, you're joining a team of 500 people sometimes in these institutions, and yet it doesn't feel like a community, you know. So what, what, would, it, what would it take to make that happen? And how beautiful would it be if you were in a team of 500 and you felt like you trusted each other and like you could do anything because you had that trust? Big, bold, you know? So, yeah. This is the perfect opportunity in this moment for institutions to listen and learn and and really pay attention to how activists are doing it and getting it done because some pretty radical and magical stuff is happening right now. Those are some pretty extraordinary concluding thoughts. And I wonder if we might close out our conversation with a question about what is most exciting to you these days? Where are you going next? What are you doing? And how can we find you as we continue these conversations? Yes, I mean, amazing. I'm so currently completely obsessed with uh, my longtime love, speculative fiction. Uh, and I've been writing a lot of plays that are speculative fiction. So I'm working on a new project that's uh, part two of a, a project I did called Antarctica that was at the Biennial for 2019 in Toronto, in Toronto. And so I'm doing a follow-up to that project for the 2022 Biennial. And it's called uh, Mary Birdland or Freedom, which is Mary Birdland is the name of the one free territory in Antarctica that hasn't been claimed by anyone. Um, so the, the project is a film and installation 
And it tells the story about what happens to these three BIPOC Antarcticans when they reach the free territory and try to set up their own space. Um, and a spoiler alert, uh, nothing is what they expected. So it's been really amazing working on film, uh, working with um, a, a film crew, working with Michelle Lau on camera, which has been amazing. And then the actors reprising their roles, Yusuf Kadura, Dinky Smith, and um, Raven Wing, but then also adding Heath Salazar um, as uh, uh, one of the characters, which I, I don't want to give it away, but that is another character. And it's been amazing. We've been really having a lot of fun and getting to talk about colonization and getting to talk about white supremacy and getting to talk about climate change through the storytelling. And again, bright, you know, elaborate textiles. There are these geodesic domes. Like there's just, it's been really, really beautiful. Um, so I'm really uh, excited and working on that. And, and that will be at the Toronto Biennial starting in March 2022. And you can find out more information at my website, which is myname.com. Thanks, Cyrus. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Such a pleasure, as always. I, I must say that... Uh, I, in our conversation in Chicago now a few years ago, we were walking through a Frank Lloyd Wright house, I think, and we were talking about, you know, the onstage versus the offstage conversations that we have in a variety of institutional contexts. And you had casually mentioned, you know, institutional resource extraction as something yeah. we do where we're you know, repurposing departmental funds or moving things around in ways that the institution might not know. And I have to tell you, how many times a month I use the phrase institutional <laughs> resource extraction and cite you without fail. But I really do feel like it's its, it's, its own method and deserves its own time and space in, a, in another Absolutely. conversation at another time. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, it's, the light. It's, it's how you get anything done, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, thanks for hanging out with us today. We will link you up to the field school. It, you know, these conversation pods will live online through the AGGV, hopefully for a long time. And we hope to keep adding to them long after the frame of this first iteration and that we keep the initiative malleable and ever transforming. And we're grateful that you're a part. Thank you. Good luck with um, everything. Thanks. Thank you.